Now, please welcome to the stage Colonel Mike Warlick, U.S. Marine Corps retired, Vice President, AFSEA International. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of TechNet Augusta. I, uh, I got to say that the first day here was just off the chart in terms of attendance and participation and activities. And day two, which is today, and day three are, are going to be no different. I want to go over some things to, to start the uh, day off so that you, you get a good snapshot of uh, where we're going today. I do want to remind you as I go into this that there is an app out there, and the app is very comprehensive to include bios of the speakers and what have you. If you don't have that, please download that uh, so you can uh, see everything that's taking place in a very timely manner to include getting notifications of when things start. I want to start uh, today by highlighting what we did yesterday just a little bit. We had General Morrison to come set the stage the first thing yesterday. Uh, he talked about SEMA, which is the, the theme of our, our, our event this week, and how that's evolving at the cyber COE. He was followed by General Funk. Uh, General Funk was VTC then, as, as you uh, know if you were here. He did a great job talking about the commander's perspective and the needs uh, for him to be able to uh, com command and control, not to mention just communicate uh, in a degraded environment and how his folks are working at that at the, in a training environment to pr prepare for the next level. We also had yesterday uh, our first series of tech talks. And tech talks are roughly an hour long and they cover uh, a, a, a industry's perspective on exactly what they can offer you. They've been very popular here. And if you're looking for a particular technology, that's a good place to look. Now, bringing it up to where we are today. Your lunch yesterday, I think I heard a lot of positive comments about the lunch. The lunch is going to be served the same way today. It'll be served in the, uh, in the hallway, the James Brown area again. And there's tables outside and inside that you can uh, sit at. Uh, if it rains like heck, like it did yesterday, everybody was dry outside. There's lots of round tables for you. And it also gives you an opportunity to walk the floor uh, during uh, an extended lunch period. Multiple sessions being held today are approved by the cybersecurity certification and maintenance requirements. We have over 20 over the course of the, uh, the week. And you, you really should take advantage of that. If you're an FC member and you attend a class, you get the automatic uh, credit. If you're a non-member, you have to apply yourself to make it easy on yourself. Go down and visit the AFSEA booth at, uh, on the 100 aisle. A number of people took advantage of that yesterday, and I think part of that was to get the certifications right up front. We have two panel sessions being presented in the engagement theater in the exhibit hall. That's also been very successful. It's right in the center if you haven't seen that already. From noon to, uh, from noon to 115, how innovation, community, and training enhance cybersecurity. We're really excited about this session. It focuses on Augusta region and the place to be for the future cybersecurity, and I think everybody here senses that. And from 1.30 to 2.45, uh, followed by a reception in the piano lobby and near the Estes Room, which is back to my right, to your left, all the way down the hall, uh, from 4.30 to 5.30, there'll be a women's reception for women in cyber uh, panel that goes earlier in the afternoon. Uh, Jennifer Knapper will be the uh, moderator for the women's cyber panel. There'll also be two government procurement roundtables focused on small business and were put together by the FC Augusta Fort Gordon chapter. The chapter's done a lot for presentations on Monday and throughout the, uh, the week. The first one uh, today is at 1045. It, it'll be entitled uh, Cyber Procurement Strategies and Opportunities. Uh, the second one uh, will be uh, for small business and the second one from 1 to 215, what does a successful prime subcontractor relationship look like? Uh, these are must attends, I think, for if you're a small business and you're looking to move up in the, uh, in the area. As mentioned yesterday, for the first time at TechNet, we were presenting a series of solution reviews. These are problems that were identified by the Cyber Center of Excellence. We provided them to industry. Uh, a number of industry uh, organizations provided feedback in the form of a 500-word uh, uh, solution abstract. From these abstracts, eight were selected to be presented over the course of today. And uh, these are problems that have been identified, but they're not formal problems. They're not RFIs or things like that. Uh, these have been very popular 
and they're very challenging for organizations to even create the problem or, or to establish the problem and be able to articulate what, what uh, the need might be. From 1 to 2 today, the Army Rapid Capabilities Office will hold an open door session in Lamar B and C. This will be headed by Doug Wilsey. You're going to meet him in just a minute if you don't know him. Uh, Mr. Wilsey will also be available for one-on-ones following the session. So that's a, that's a great follow-on uh, to this panel uh, to continue the dialogue. From 3 to 4.30 this afternoon, uh, we'll move into various evening network activities. Uh, this, we'll have the SEMA panel, uh, building the integrated uh, SEMA at the tactical level. Uh, representatives from NETCOM, AMC, and so forth will be there. Uh, I want to remind everybody here that this is here this week. Uh, they've got a, a, a booth, uh, it's uh, 821. Uh, stop by to see live uh, streaming activities and also there's a, uh, a, a discussion on a DOD mobility which has a high interest. The evening's network activities kick off at four with the Future Leaders poster show in the Riverwalk hallway. Uh, come view students, we've got lots of students here today and tomorrow. And the evening networking classes kick off at uh, four uh, with the Future Leaders poster show again. And from 4.30 to 5.30, the Women in Cyber panel, or, uh, panel reception will take place uh, in the Riverwalk, and I mentioned that just a minute ago. And then, not last, last but not least, from 5 to 7, the Augusta Fort Gordon chapter is hosting the young FCA, and you heard yesterday, not so young FCA uh, social across the street from the Convention Center at the men's refinery and inside the drive. So once again, you can see we have a power-packed day. And uh, we look forward to uh, your participation in as many events of these that interest you. Okay, I'd like to now move to the panel. They've been uh, patiently waiting. So this morning, uh, we, uh, we have a, a really interesting panel for you. Uh, the, uh, the panel centers around a broad spectrum, somewhat uh, centered on CECOM, uh, before arriving to seek, uh, and our, our moderator this morning is Major General Randy Taylor. Before arriving at CECOM, General Taylor most recently served at the Army CIO G6 as the Director for Architecture, Operations, Networks, and Space, where he was responsible for establishing and maintaining strategy, policy, and guidance to enable the mission across the, the global enterprise and throughout the Army network. Some things don't change. He took a step up to CECOM. Among his uh, recent command assignments were Brigade Commander of DISA, CONUS, at Scott Air Force Base, and the Commander of the 112th Signal Battalion Special Operations Airborne at Fort Bragg, and while deployed uh, in Operation Enduring Freedom and also in Af Afghanistan and also Operation Iraqi Freedom. He assumed his current role as the 15th Commander of the Army's Communication Electronics Command and Senior uh, Commander of Aberdeen Proving Ground uh, in April of this year, 2017 where he serves as the Army's Command, Control, Computers, Communication, Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance a Material Integrator. He does have a big job. He's responsible for enabling the Army's warfighting readiness by providing sustainable global C4I support across the uh, spectrum. General Taylor also assisted in uh, the, uh, forming the panel today uh, to provide you with a message and information uh, that will be directly related uh, to not just this event, but where the Army is going in the C4I SR arena. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please join me in a warm welcome for General Taylor and his panel. Good morning. So it's my pleasure to help moderate this panel this morning, and I want to thank you for joining us for the next hour, hour and a half. We're going to have a great discussion. Uh, especially impressed that you're here so early after those awesome receptions last night. So we're off to a good start. What I'd like to do before I tell you a little bit about CECOM, the U.S. Army Communications Electronics Command, and APG, Aberdeen Proving Ground, where I'm the senior commander, I'd like to have each of our panelists introduce themselves, and then they'll toss it back to me. So we start with you, Gary. Uh, my name is Gary Martin. I'm the Program Executive Officer for Command Control Communications Tactical, or C3T. I'm Doug Wiltsey. I'm the Director of the Army Rapid Capability Office and the Director of the System of System Engineering and Integration Office in Assault. I'm Kevin Stoddard. I am the Chief of Staff of PEO Enterprise Information Systems. Good morning. Uh, Mark Kitts. I'm the Chief Engineer for PEO uh, Intelligence, Electronic Warfare, and Sensors. All right. That's quite a lineup. Well, thank you. So as I said, I'm from APG, Aberdeen Proving Ground, the Army's oldest proving ground. And this year, we're celebrating our centennial 100th anniversary. I'd like to invite you all to our big ball on the 20th of October. You can check that out online if you're interested. 
So we've changed quite a bit, though, over the last 100 years. You know, until fairly recently, until the, the last BRAC, we were the home of the Ordnance School, and they've since moved to Fort Lee. And we've moved from a uh, population of primarily junior grades, a very transient training population, to now a very mature, very uh, fairly fixed uh, population of senior professionals. Uh, we have at APG about 27,000 people that work there between APG North and South. South also sometimes referred to Edgewood Arsenal, which it used to be. And then also Adelphi, Maryland, where Army Research Lab is part of this complex of uh, APG properties. And so about 27,000 people, uh, of whom about 4,000 are really PhDs and engineers, postgraduate post uh, professionals, and then many more uh, certified individuals. We are the home of now one, not two, but six centers of excellence on a wide variety of things. C4ISR, from which I uh, represent, but also in, in the world of chem bio and, and personnel security investigations, tests and evaluation, research and development. It, it goes on and on, quite extensive uh, portfolio there. So we've, with the last rack, really grown from relatively small installation to now what we call like a, a mega installation. And if you've been there recently, you've seen some of the incredible facilities that we've benefited from the BRAC with, uh, and, and best, I think, in DOD. But what's really special, if you haven't been there, is the location on the Chesapeake Bay. We have 144 miles of shoreline on the Chesapeake Bay. And if uh, you just like being out in nature and enjoying uh, the best of this country, you'll find it right there. This is not the hard sell, actually. I don't want to say too much, because I. I'm happy that APG is kind of the best kept secret in the Army. I'd like to keep it that way a little bit. But uh, fun fact, we have over 300, just about 400 uh, eagles, American bald eagles at APG. So it's a bit of a green oasis. If you drive north of Baltimore and, uh, and uh, get beyond the urban sprawl, you'll find this, this green oasis that is Aberdeen Proving Ground, where a lot of professionals uh, work. So I invite you to come up there if you haven't. Have lunch while you're there. You look out across the Chesapeake Bay and you will be convinced it's really the best view of any Army installation. Uh, and if you want a better view, you're going to have to go join the Navy. So please, please come visit us. So I'm also, uh, in addition to the senior commander for Aberdeen Proving Ground, the commander of SECOM, U.S. Army Communications Electronics Command. That's about 16,000 people uh, across the globe uh, supporting our warfighters day and night in, in, in every theater. So I'll tell you a little bit about how we're structured and what we do. But the main thing is that we're there uh, to sustain uh, C4RSR. Uh, and we do that with uh, several subordinate commands. I'll start first with our, our ILSC, our Integrated Logistics Sustainment Command. And basically, they are responsible. That's it really, it's, a, it's a, not a command, it's a, it's a center that's uh, led by a director in SCS, Liz Miranda. Uh, but they're responsible really for the supplies and the repairs and, and to some extent, the training for our systems that we field across the Army. They manage 45,000 items of supply, everything from cables to circuit cards to end items uh, that the Army needs. So that's a big deal, big budget operation. If I, and you know, in this business, we quite often get so focused on you know, the device, the end item, and, we, and the procurement of that. And that's where a lot of the discussions focus. But if you're really interested in this business and understanding it uh, deeper, just follow the money and it will take you to sustainment. And that's the business I find myself in now. Also, we have as a subordinate entity uh, the Army Software Engineering Center, led by an SES, Jen Zabosny. Uh, great responsibilities for most of the Army's software that we field, for all the versions, and believe me, there's a lot, but also the patching and updating of, of that, especially on our tactical systems, and coming up ways to innovate and, and, and patch faster, uh, patch in a centralized or remote manner and uh, we can talk some more about that if you like. We also have Toby Hanna Army Depot, not Depot, Depot. When I showed up, that was the first thing they corrected me on. I said, call it a depot, and everybody piled on me. So it's a depot, and it's up in Toby Hanna, Pennsylvania. That's where the Army's organic industrial base resides for C4ISR sustainment. So when we got to reset equipment, or repair it, or maybe sometimes engineer it, manufacture it, uh, that's where it's done. The, the best depot by far in the Army, and I'm just not just bragging because I'm the commander, but when you look at all the metrics and how we measure the performance of our depots, uh, that is really the crown jewel of the Army's organic industrial base. We also uh, lead the Army's effort in engineering for all things network with our installation 
I'm sorry, Information Systems Engineering Command, which is, all right. We have the Commander, Nikki Morris here from Fort Huachuca, Arizona. And they're co-located with NETCOM. They work very closely with PEIS and Army Cyber, but much of the Army's uh, hard uh, engineering work is, is led by, by them. And they're doing great things, such a diverse portfolio, from upgrading the infrastructure at the White House right now uh, with a major renovation project going on. You may have heard about that in the news a little bit but involved in upgrading infrastructure out in Korea. Uh, you may have heard, even heard about that in the news a little bit. Uh, it's a lot of other things, and we can talk more about that if you'd like. And then we have the, uh, the Central Technical Support Facility out at Fort Hood, Arizona, which is really something that grew up out of Task Force 21, if you remember that, the uh, first digitized division. Anybody been around long enough to remember that? Okay, and I know John Rutt's back there. He was right in the middle of all that. So uh, they've since uh, stuck around, their missions evolved, but they're primarily focused on certification of, uh, of, of networks, but the, the things that we put on networks, especially in the tactical environment and interoperability. And so they do that, but we're expanding their mission. Uh, and I think we can, uh, I know we get more out of them. There's, there's immense talent there. So we're partnering with the senior commander there, General Funk, we heard from him yesterday in Third Corps, and, and his really his passion for command post and getting them uh, more capable, especially at the division and core level. So he's got some ideas on initiatives and how we take advantage of uh, the CTSF out there and partner and do that. So that's kind of a broad overview uh, for CECOM, how we're structured, some of the things we do. And uh, I invite uh, your questions in a little bit. What I'd like to do is go down the line and have each one of our panelists talk a little bit about who they are and uh, where they're from and what's on their mind today. So Gary, Martin, if I could start with you, please. Well, good morning. It's great to be back here at uh, Fort Gordon. Uh, what I'd like to do this morning is really talk about uh, three topics, uh, specifically things we're doing to make the system that we're deploying less complex, more expeditionary in what we're doing to get after operation in contested environment. And I'll start with less complex. So we, we've been fielding what we call capability set uh, networking solutions since 2013 consisting of our WinTI system, a warfighter information network, new tactical digital radios that really provide an interconnected solution uh, for the lower TI or for battalion and below, uh, enhancements to our mission command systems and so forth. And all of this, quite frankly, is a significant amount of capability that gets deployed down into the BCT area. And so one of the things that we've been trying to do is get after simplification of the systems in terms of operating the systems, initializing and configuring, because for these systems we have a tremendous amount of initialization that needs to happen for radios and, and portions of the network, uh, and then some things we're doing in the future to enhance it. So let me walk you through a couple of these. So WinT, we started fielding WinT Increment 2 a couple years ago. Uh, WinT Increment 2 significantly expanded uh, the amount of capability we gave to Brigade. Uh, WinT Increment 1, the at the halt was principally at CPs. The on-the-move portion of WinT Increment 2 uh, in our initial fieldings to uh, the uh, 82nd, 10th uh, Mountain, so forth, uh, we were fielding upwards of 40-some-odd mobile nodes. These are all SATCOM and line-of-sight uh, communications nodes. Most of these are bolted onto a radio commander's vehicle, uh, and uh, they generally don't come with a signal operator. And so the initial designs that we put out uh, in the field uh, caused some degree of training challenges because the task that it took to actually turn the system on, get it up on the air, and operate uh, was, was complex. And so uh, about a year and a half ago, we started delivering the revised user interface, which essentially you turn it on, hit a button, and it acquires the satellites. Uh, the message in that, though, is that we, we really were building a solution for signal operators, and you find out that you get general purpose users using the equipment that's a very different interface that one has to design. So we've carried that work into the uh, tactical communications node as well as the network operations security center, which we have now tested at NIE, which just out there over the course of the last few months. Uh, we've taken that package and brought it down in size physically from medium tactical vehicles onto uh, Humvees and have made it far more uh, simple for, for operations. The tactical radios are fairly complex. I mean, even SINGARs, I was around in the days when we deployed SINGARs. It was a bit of a training burden at first, particularly with regards to the uh, AJ capability. Well, the radios we're putting out today are even more complex. They're networking 
boxes. They're not simply push-to-talk radios, and so they require configurations and network settings and so forth. And so part of that, the problem that we've had is the initialization of, of the radios themselves. It takes a fair amount of manually intensive activities. You physically have to load a load device, go to every radio and load them up. Um, one of the things that we've uh, struggled with for probably three or four years now as we've deployed this is unit task reorganization. What happens if I have to chop someone over to another unit, a battalion from one brigade to another brigade? Well, where does he get all these presets? And to have to physically go out and touch all the radios is very cumbersome and complex. So one of the initial capabilities that, that we've prototyped and will deliver here in about, about a year is what we call over-the-air de over demand information networking. So a radio that comes in contact with a unit, whether they're attached to it by design or simply they happen to uh, come across them on the battlefield, much like you do today. If you walk into a hotel, uh, your cell phone will tell you there's a Wi-Fi link and there's some things you can do to, to join that network. Well, we've added that capability. We'll roll it out in about a year where a unit will be able to detect, because these radios are very wide band RF. They sense everything that's around them. Uh, but if you don't have the presets, they're sort of ignoring uh, what's around them. So in this case, they'll be able to detect it, tell the operator that he's coming within uh, proximity of another network, and he'll actually be able to see the net ID and decide if he wants to join. And if he presses a button, he'll get the uh, network uh, presets uh, delivered to him over the air. And so that'll take about three minutes for that to happen and simply uh, eliminate all of the running around that goes on with uh, filled devices and so forth. Our common operating environment, that's our next generation um, command post, uh, mission command systems, command post mounted, dismounted. Uh, we are uh, currently uh, on schedule to deliver the version three of COE for next uh, fall for testing at NIE 18.2. We will converge all of the mission command, the maneuver capability for V3. So GCCS Army, CPOF, Tiger, Command Web, the engineering capability will all be converged on top of one common uh, capability. So common look and feel, a single mapping solution, and over time we will converge other mission command capabilities on that as well. Uh, that will render everything to a common look and feel. So if the commander is in the uh, CP, decides to get into his stack or into vehicle and move on, he will have the exact same look and feel for what today we would call JBCP or Blue Force Tracker. Uh, maps will look the same, the buttonology will be the same, and significantly reduce the training burden. And then one of the efforts that we've got underway uh, working with Forcecom now is trying to get all of our mission command systems to a common baseline. We have multiple versions of CPOF. A FATIDS, GCCS Army. Uh, by design, they do work together, but they're not all identical. And so some of the later versions have functionality that isn't in previous versions. And so the unit, the soldier goes from one unit to the other. Things look a little different. Features are uh, not necessarily consistent across the board. So we're working with Forcecom to deliver a common software baseline for Mission Command by the end of 19. That's a major, major undertaking specifically with regards to getting access to COMPO 2 and COMPO 3 units. Um, one of the things that I'd, I'd put out there is a need. You know, we, we uh, I don't think we do a very good job in terms of putting constraints up front on simplifying the systems that we build. And so we just had the Sergeant Major of the Army up at Aberdeen a couple days ago, last week actually, and his comment was, if we have any system in the IT arena that's general purpose operated that requires a manual or a training, we shouldn't buy it. Now that's, that's an extreme. That's, that may be impossible to do, but why shouldn't that be the goal? Everyone points to an iPhone, right? Who's ever gone to a net class for iPhone or a Samsung device? Now there's a lot of work that went into designing these systems so they are user friendly. I, I think that's where our next major emphasis needs to be in my space. Designing systems that require zero training is an objective. We may not get there, but I, I think if we don't do something to get after that problem, we will always be chasing a system that will be complex for, for operators to, to adapt to. In terms of expeditionary capability, so I just talked about the uh, WinT increment two. So we just tested it uh, at NIE uh, 17.2 our new downsized versions of the uh, tactical communications node and the network operations security center. 
Uh, we fielded Win T Increment 2 to the Light Infantry Divisions as the pri pri primary fielded units. Part of that was because integrating into the heavy platforms, the Abrams, the Bradleys, the Strikers, require a significantly greater amount of engineering uh, to go into that and safety certification and so forth. So we focused on the light infantry. But for force protection measures as we fielded into theater, we put everything on an MRAP ATV. Now it's great if you're in theater, but when you're not in theater, what does a light infantry unit do with MRAP ATVs? They certainly can't sling load it. They don't load it and take it with them. So, you know, initial entry and expedition area is not part of uh, the vehicle construct. So by moving everything onto Humvees and, and getting them to a point where they can actually sling load and take it with them when they need to or roll on, roll off is, is a significant uh, uh, value and uh, got great feedback from the NIE. Uh, the soldier network extension, this mobile SATCOM on the move node that's part of Winty Increment 2. Uh, Technology has moved along. We can't. Uh, spin out new capability as fast as the IT industry can develop it, but we're actually making some pretty good progress in terms of downsizing the electronics. A lot of that is coming in the form of computing power that just con continues to, to move exponentially, but more importantly, our ability now to virtualize devices in software as opposed to hardware boxes. So virtual firewalls and virtual routers and those kinds of things. So we've significantly shrunk uh, in partnership with, with our team at GED, the, Winty increment to SNE, and we can now get it into a vehicle with about 50% less size, less weight, and what used to be about seven or eight boxes are now three. So cabling and wire harnesses and so forth have significantly reduced. And so that'll be the next baseline that we feel starting next year. Uh, we will start fielding in 18 our T2C2, our expeditionary SATCOM systems. Two versions, a V1 that's um, a 1.2 meter dish, and the other one is a 2.4. Uh, those are uh, transit case capable. You load them onto a commercial aircraft, um, providing great capability for initial entry, all interoperable and compatible with the WinT system. McNay is a box that we've been working on to essentially start tunneling the Intel traffic over the uh, operational network or the, or the WinT system. Today, if you go to a CP, uh, you'll see a Trojan Spirit as well as a Winty uh, SATCOM terminal. Uh, in some cases, especially for initial entry, uh, if a unit's got to bring both a Trojan, which is a, a 2.4 meter dish on a Humvee, as well as the uh, Winty systems, there's a tremendous amount of uh, stuff they've got to bring to include generators and power and so forth. And so by being able to provide a box that's about the size of a half a foot locker, that can now tr uh, tunnel that traffic over Win T. You eliminate the signature of how, mu how much you're radiating at the CP, and you significantly reduce the size and weight. And we've got uh, a version of that out at the NIE with the second of the first now. Uh, there's a uh, direct, uh, direct requirement that we're expecting to get for expeditionary command posts, uh, getting back to the mode of getting our command post infrastructure, shelters and so forth, much more uh, expedition there is so smaller, integrated onto the vehicle, the ability to set up and tear it down about 30 minutes as opposed to the time it takes today, and we'll, we'll be starting that next year. And finally, in the area of cyber defense, there are a couple things that we've done. One is uh, for all of our systems now, we go through two things uh, that we, we traditionally have not done. One is we send all of our software to General uh, Taylor's team, and they run it through a software assurance test uh, procedure and, and, and to the extent that we can, whether it's develop code or things that are going out to test or even in sustainment, we look for software uh, issues that may lead to vulnerabilities in the code. And, and we're, we're getting great feedback and, and improvements out of that. And we're sending all of our systems to the National Cyber Range run by OSD down in Atlanta or in uh, Orlando and getting uh, great uh, feedback on that. And all of that is getting us into the cycle of putting fixes into the software to eliminate some cyber vulnerabilities. Uh, we've added uh, PKI, uh, particularly in the Winty system, uh, for uh, non-personal entities, eliminating a tremendous number of the passwords that soldiers had to enter. And of course, whenever there's a password uh, manually entered is, is certainly an error for potential vulnerability as uh, eliminates the, uh, the likelihood of default passwords or common passwords being utilized, which tends to be part of the things that we see as vulnerabilities when we go through tests. Uh, waveforms, we've got three enhancements we're doing to get after operation in contested environment. 
Uh, the NCWA form that's used currently in our WinT system, we're going through a, an upgrade to provide uh, improved AJ performance. We'll see that uh, deployed uh, in the 2020 timeframe, and that's a software upgrade to the existing modings we're buying. Uh, SRW Narrowband, we're working with Trellisware and a couple other uh, companies to eliminate the manual routing uh, in our waveforms. This will provide us the ability to actually uh, go radio silent when we want to, because right now on these manual waveforms, you don't have to transmit for the radio to actually be sending energy, because it's routing and maintaining connectivity behind the scenes. So a soldier may think that he's not pushing any data through, but the radios are continuing to emanate. So we'll be able to actually turn that off. Um, and also uh, Singars. There's been a lot of talk of Singars crypto modernization. Uh, we were supposed to start this year with an upgrade to Singars for the ComSec chip. I think we've gotten a very robust conversation in terms of do we simply change the crypto or do we look to modernize a waveform to get much better AJ protection? And I think that's the path that we're on working with our coalition partners, uh, NSA, and the team at uh, Marine Corps, Navy, and the Air Force in terms of what our collective strategy ought to be. Uh, and finally, uh, looking at uh, our signal modernization program that will provide the ability to deliver uh, modern capabilities, uh, non-SATCOM based. Our network today is largely dependent on satellite communications, certainly viewed as a potential vulnerability. Uh, particularly in a contested environment. So things like next generation tropo scatter. We'll be releasing an RFP out next year for, for a new capability for tropo scatter. Uh, significant enhancements in throughput and in uh, range. And that'll be a, a great modernization for the uh, command post capability. A multi band, multi channel uh, radios to replace the old uh, high capacity line of sight radios going from 34 megabits to about 400 megabits per second per link, so they'll enrich the CP capability. We had the Trilos radio at NIE this fall, or just this summer for testing. And finally, taking uh, advantage of uh, red teams and blue teams activity. So every NIE, uh, there is a red team that goes through and looks at vulnerability testing of our systems. They come back uh, to Aberdeen at the end of each event. We go through each of the findings they've gotten uh, as a collective community and go after a deliberate attempt to, to fix the problem. Oftentimes you find out that a system under test is detected as having a vulnerability, but it's because they're coming in somewhere else in the network. And, and when you've got all these networks plugged together, vulnerabilities can come in from any angle. So uh, reducing the attack surface and taking advantage of these activities has been a big part of that. Our biggest need in this area is a low probability of intercept and detect waveforms. We do not have a lot of things in our inventory today that are not easily detectable. So we'll, we'll enhance uh, anti-jam capability over time, uh, but anything in, in, in industry that has uh, ideas on where we can go on waveforms that are difficult to detect, we'd love to hear what you've got. And I'll pause here for questions later. Yeah. Very good, thanks Gary, appreciate that. So before we take questions, we'll work down the table for some other opening comments. Mr. Doug Wilson. Uh, good morning, uh, thanks for uh, giving us the opportunity to, to be here today. Um, name's Doug Wiltsey. I run the Army Rapid Capability Office, which is uh, coming up on its one-year anniversary here in a few weeks. Um, the, the office was stood up, for those who haven't heard this, the office was stood up to, to really address uh, several things, but the, the, the real focus is on strategic gaps uh, that are generated from the combatant commands that there is no material solution in one to five years. And so when you look at a lot of the, there's a lot of uh, rapid capability offices out there, uh, we tend to be more formation-based than we do uh, product-based uh, like the Air Force. But the idea is really to address those strategic gaps that uh, have been identified from the combatant commands that we need to get after. Um, we have a very unique chain of command. Uh, we report to the secretary, the chief of staff, and the Army acquisition executive. Uh, we get a lot of help from other folks, but those are the people that are telling us what to do. Um, and, and the idea is not to just be a material solution, but it's got to be a, a solution that addresses all of the dotlum as it gets incorporated. Uh, Specifically, the three things that are on the top of uh, the board's list are what's the effect on force structure, what's the effect on training, and what's the effect on sustainment. Uh, one of the things that um, 
we've got to have a conscious discussion on as we bring this kid in is, is how will it be employed? In some cases, we're actually working with uh, John Morrison's group uh, here at the Cyber Center of Excellence to develop CONOPS and TTPs on how things will be employed. Uh, I think it's fairly well known in, in, the, in the press that uh, our, our starting point was electronic warfare, um, uh, assured p and and cyber. Uh, we've moved into a few other areas, uh, but the, the programs that, are really, that we're really focused on is uh, contested environments uh, with near-peer competitors. That, that if you sum it up, that's, that's the space that we're working on. Um, and so the focus for us is really to do two things. Rapidly prototype to get to an operational assessment and then make a decision on whether we're gonna field. We will not field to the entire army. We will field to the combatant command that has the strategic gap. And then we will, we will feed into the enduring programs that information that we get. We, we will never, I can't say never, but. We're not designed to build the solution that is the enduring institutional solution. Because if, if it was available today, those guys would be buying it and fielding it. And so what we're really trying to do is take this strategic gap, see how much we can reduce the operational risk for the commander that will allow him to fight it. And it, it really just tries to get him to a, to a place of parity, or maybe maybe a little bit below, maybe a little bit above, that allows him to, to bring the initiative that allow him to, to, to win the fight. Um, a lot of this is driven by uh, the formations that we work on, and it's more of a holistic approach. I, I haven't seen a solution yet that had one answer. And so what you will see is uh, from us are a multitude of questions that come out that are, as you, as, as you become more familiar with it, you'll see how all the pieces come together. We tend to start at the edge first and then work our way back. The example in EW is we're starting brigade and below. Uh, in phase one, in phase two, we're, we're, we're enhancing brigade and below and then adding capability at division and core. So think land combatant commander. And then the final phase will be to connect to the Joint Task Force, think, think Air Force, think Navy, and bring all that piece together. Um, and the, again, the idea is to be able to exercise this so that we are continually informing what the capability is, how it will be employed, who's going to use it, and, and how do we support that. Uh, we, we utilize, uh, we just came out of 17.2 uh, with a bunch of stuff that Gary had in there um, uh, for electronic warfare to get an assessment from them on, on the capability. Interesting answers that came back, not anything that was a surprise. Infantrymen don't like carrying EW equipment because they're a rifle and they don't want to come out of the fight. We've got to work, those are the force structure kinds of issues that we've got to be able to address. How do you bring the information into the talk and how do you exchange it between the two and the three and how do you build that into the op plan? It's a, it, and as we go, we'll learn more and more. Intention is to get to a decision uh, on electronic warfare by this Christmas, a little bit before this Christmas, we're hoping, uh, to, to field into Europe um, we're looking at requirements in Korea. It's not a surprise to anybody that, that, that uh, we've got our head turned to Korea. Um, at p and will be following next summer in operational assessments and, and we'll go from there. Um, so, so from the Rapid Capability Office, that, that's, that's kind of how we do it and, and what we do. Um, the, the other perspective I would give you is that uh, you're gonna see so our, our, our real purpose is to focus on prototyping, assessments, and then field. I think you're gonna see a lot more of that kind of capability across the Army of the use of prototypes. The language and law is now allowing us to do that. It can be done by, by anyone in the acquisition community, and I think that's gonna be a, a capability that, that as we enhance it, is really gonna get us a lot of, of, of great feedback. Um, one of the big things we do uh, within the organization is we're rather small. 
So our focus is collaboration. We collaborate with anybody who wants to, and it's from an idea of with uh, being able to take capabilities that someone else is developing, and if we only have to deal with the Army side of it, we can leverage their funds and what they're doing and accelerate capability. So we, I have a team, the, uh, the Emerging Technology Office, Rob Monto is here somewhere, um, who is our, our team lead that is leaning out to places like within the arm, within the Department of Defense and even beyond the Department of Defense, the federal government. He's looking at uh, what the Strategic Capability Office is doing. He's looking what DIUX is doing. He's looking what DARPA is doing. A lot of connections with the, with the Special Operations Command down in Tampa. Um, work through a lot of the OTAs to get to consortiums to get to ideas. And so what you'll tend to see from us is the, the initial phase that we work in, we're trying to grab or modify kit that we have and we can repurpose it. That's the fastest way to get to the end. The second is what is out there that, that we need to, to organize in a different way to be able to apply. What you'll see though is as we get our feet set with how the con ops will be done, the type of material we're looking for, we're gonna continue to come back out to industry to look for best of breed. The REF did one on a dismounted capability for EW, I don't know, within the last six months. We're leveraging that for what we do in the dismount. You're gonna see something from us on mounted, because although we have a good mounted system, we wanna make sure that it is the best mounted system. And that'll happen over time uh, until, we, uh, un until we get to a place where uh, the board says we're out and the enduring program is coming. Um, so last observation I, I'd make is with my other hat as the System of System Engineering and Integration Chief. Uh, our, our focus there is, is kind of four areas. Uh, we do the material side and the integration piece for the NIEs. We start with architecture and analysis work. We, we define uh, the mission threads as to how we will evaluate products work with the PMs that are going to be there to, to integrate into the, the equipment, work with the JMC on how they will actually run the con ops to, to run the exercise. There's a, great, there, there's a great benefit to running those kinds of exercises with these troops, and I'm, I'm really excited about the fact that we are now not, we do not have a dedicated unit because we're gonna learn a significant amount about the Army as we move from a heavy brigade to an air assault brigade to a light brigade and then to a striker brigade. As we move through those sequences, we're going to find that there are going to be uniquenesses there that we have to be able to, to appreciate, uh, but, but also gives us the ability to know, to get a finger on the pulse of where the active army is, and even the reserve corps, with regard to readiness and how well they use the equipment. And so um, it's a great activity. RCO leverages it very heavily because it's an opportunity to use an exercise that's already in place. Uh, lastly, what I would tell you is I think from the assault standpoint, what you're gonna see is uh, a blending of how do we do prototyping. One of the things uh, Lieutenant General Ostrowski has been saying uh, since he uh, took the position as the military deputy is try and stay left of B. So for for, for you all who I think understand this, there's a milestone A, tech, technology maturation, there's a milestone B, engineering and manufacturing development, there's a milestone C, production. Where he wants to stay is in that prototyping phase as long as possible. Helps us refine requirements, get an understanding of what capabilities can do, understand how that affects the rest of the dotlum, so that as we get into EMD, we can go fast. And so, this ability to prototype is really going, I think we're in our infancy, it's really gonna, gonna expand as we go forward. With that? Very good, thank you, Doug. Kevin from EIS. Oh, good morning, thank you, sir. Um, again, I'm uh, Colonel Kevin Stoddard, the Chief of Staff of PEO EIS, and uh, on behalf of, uh, of our PEO, Brigadier General Pat Burden, I really appreciate, and we really appreciate the opportunity uh, for this uh, important uh, conversation. This community and this mission and the network itself is, is very important to, to what we do in EIS and all of us do every day with it. When you look at uh, our mission area, you know, we're, we're to deliver innovative and cost-effective IT solutions connecting the global army from the, the tactical edge 
all the way through to the strategic edge in the areas of finance, human capital, logistics, to networks, comms, and the enterprise uh, services. And so we have uh, six uh, project offices that execute that mission every day. And I found it pretty interesting as I was listening to the conversation and, and we're talking today about the multi-domain environment and how we operate in that environment. And there's some key words that tend to come out in all of our conversations. And it, it guides us in our doctrine, it guides us in how we shape our programs and how we structure ourselves and, um, and how we plan for the future. And if you look at it like, for example, domain, uh, domination, to dominate the, um, the environment, to stay ahead of our adversaries, to be flexible, at the strategic and all of the various different levels, we have to maintain that, that flexibility. So how we structure our programs and, and our contracts and, and where we're engaged as programs is very important. We have to be adaptive, our programs have to be expeditionary, and they have to be synchronized with the community. And I hear the word integration, and the capability has to be integrated across the area. So our environment, we, we're, we're experiencing a threat every day in, in the cyber world. It's, it's happening today. So vigilance is first and foremost in what we do. So we have to stay and continue to maintain a very secure uh, environment. And we have to be able to recover quickly in this environment. We have to sustain and upgrade equipment, and we have to be flexible enough to where the user needs what he needs and where he needs it in his programs in doing that. And uh, as Mr. Martin uh, mentioned, the goal is for simplification. We have to look at you know, cost-effective ways, but at the same time, we have to look at uh, you know, driving down the training requirement for everyone. But also, we have to have the ability, when we do this, to be able to operate in a secure environment, to operate worldwide in very austere environments with it. So when we look at uh, PEOEIS, Often people will think of us as business systems at the more strategic level. But we have programs at the tactical edge, like GCSS Army. We have net modification uh, programs that are ongoing. At the strategic level, we have satellite systems, terrestrial, and the mission command center programs that are all tied again to the operational environment with it. So in this environment, we also work towards the, uh, working with the integrated group, the enterprise. We have to not only work with the functional groups, but we work pretty close to the actual users, those that are on the ground in the operational environment. We work with sustainers as well and industry in order to come up with the solutions, and that was just was mentioned, uh, areas that we're looking at is, is the prototyping, which is coming on, and how do we use prototyping to help shape um, shape our programs to resolve requirements and move forward on that. And in terms of that, we have um, established two assistant uh, PEOs. Uh, some of you may have met uh, Colonel Mike Sloan. He is the, uh, the, the assistant PEO for the Enterprise Resource Planning uh, Systems. And then we have next month we'll bring on uh, Mike Padden, who was the, uh, the PM for I, I3C2. So he will come on to work uh, those programs in the, the, uh, the net mod uh, arena. So Mike will work the ERPs, and uh, Mike Padden will work the, uh, uh, the network piece. And what do we do in there? Well, as a PEO, and it was mentioned here today already, we're looking, the PMs are looking at their programs, their requirements, their schedule, and they're moving it forward. The APEOs aren't doing their business. They're helping them facilitate their business in the near term, as well as looking forward down the road, the strategic, looking for those efficiencies, effectiveness. Where do we need to go? Where do we need to bring our, our programs to? So I think that uh, has worked very well. You have seen um, uh, the messages on Hack the ERP, for example, that came out recently, where we're now um, looking at ways to harden and, and, and secure our environment through, through the testing uh, piece of it. As well, we have uh, leadership dashboards that we're working, the migration of DISA, uh, our, our systems into the DISA architecture. All this type of work is, is being done as an initiative, but we're trying to ensure all of the P PMs under that portfolio 
are heading in the same direction and not all in different in, in inefficiency. And the, and the message is, is correct on that. So that's a big uh, step in terms of organization and making sure that we're properly organized and we're communicating uh, across the, uh, the community as well. In modernizing our units uh, and our IT infrastructure, uh, we're modernizing today our, uh, our post camps and stations around the world. We're enhancing the security of our networks. We're delivering uh, enterprise services and we're providing cyber uh, defense capabilities. The home station um, command centers. Okay, so we're implementing command um, home station mission centers for the expeditionary commands at the core and at the division levels. And this allows them to be tied to the forward expeditionary forces. A lot comes out of this, common, common equipment for the, for the divisions, tailored for, for the divisions as well. And it's focused on, on the tactical edge. We were having a discussion this morning Often, all of us have deployed. Many of the service members in here have deployed in that everyone has seen the lessons learned that came back from uh, those deployments. It's very important that a lot happens that the front lines will know about, that the, the rear echelons are not uh, familiar with, and it's that exchange of information that's happening real time, this capability provides for. It also provides the, as the forces that are in the rear prepare to go forward, there's that good information, they're already working the type of stuff and the, uh, the type of challenges, and they understand the challenges that the forward has. So again, it's taking from what is actually happening in the forward lines all the way to the rear. Again, the global connectivity that we're looking for in it. We're very active, as mentioned earlier, in Korea, uh, supporting numerous um, enterprise network initiatives. One of those is the modernization of the C4I infrastructure as part of the Yosong uh, relocation plan down to uh, Camp Humphreys in that area. So that's, on, that's been ongoing, that continues to be ongoing, and we'll continue to um, uh, support that program. We have uh, strategic satellite communications, the modernization of our long haul strategic communication infrastructure. Re recently with the launching of the satellite number nine for the wideband global SATCOM constellation. And in that launch, what we now do, and we're able to do simultaneously, is X-band, KA-band, and cross-band satellite capability with the joint forces. So all of that, all at one time in one suite. So naturally, as I mentioned earlier, we are working with our strategic partners. Um, DISA, for example, in the migration to become more efficient in terms of where we house our data and our, um, our systems. So we work with them on that migration as well as uh, the security architecture and the systems and the, uh, the joint uh, regional security stacks, JRSS uh, implementation. I know many of you are uh, interested in the um, cyber, cyber operations, cyber uh, capabilities. PEOEIS is the home of the defensive the side of um, the cyber capability and operations. Uh, last year we stood up, Lieutenant Colonel Helmore is, is now the board select PM. I'm sure many of you have uh, met, with, met with him and he's been part of uh, a lot of the ongoing discussions on the, uh, the requirements piece there. We have uh, seven programs in FY18 that we are um, putting on award. You should see in the second quarter an RFP come out to industry. Uh, for that with a award of those programs at the end of um, FY18. There's additional programs in uh, FY19, two more programs in 19, and three more uh, programs in um, FY20 on them as well. So a lot going on in the dis dis uh, defensive cyber operations. Um, as mentioned by Mr. Wiltsey, how they're getting there is they're starting out with the prototyping environment, working with the C5 consortium there at, uh, out of Picatinny Arsenal and uh, working through some of the challenges and what do we want these programs to actually, what are the capabilities that industry has um, with them. And it's helping shape, again, in that discussion, in that synchronization, helping shape uh, our program strategies for that. So uh, I'll finally wrap up with this. Um, we're here talking about NetMod and the NetMod um, structures, but we have three other um, major programs that cover the logistics and the financial uh, piece and the human capital piece in our ERPs. 
And it, with those programs, major programs, uh, it's all about the, the, the ability to collect the data and, and to make uh, real-time decisions with that data. Um, and with that data tied to all of the uh, institutions um, within the Army, across the Army, it will become uh, what we would see as the foundation for the Ar 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 Army audit readiness challenges that we face. With that, I'll stand by for the questions. Thank you, Kevin. I know we've got a lot of questions coming in there, but before we get to them, we'll pass it over to Mark from PO IEW Nest. Uh, yes, sir. Th thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me today, uh, FC. I think thank you very much. Um, uh, I promise to be brief. We'll, we'll get we'll get to questions. Uh, so uh, again, I'm Mark Kitts. I'm the uh, chief engineer for PEO IEWNS. Uh, we we at the PEO have a very diverse portfolio of capabilities. Uh, uh, we we deliver the Army sensors. We buy and deliver the Army sensors. Uh, whether those sensors support uh, uh, deployed forces in for integrated base defense, whether that's uh, uh, gate guards or, or standoff detectors for uh, IEDs or uh, any of the multitude of capabilities for integrated base defense. Uh, we also do all the air survivability capabilities for our, our um, uh, uh, rotary wing platforms and fixed wing platforms. Uh, we build the Army's ISR sensor collection and sensor enterprise, uh, the backhaul capabilities for uh, sensor processing. Uh, we also deliver the biometric, the DOD biometrics enterprise uh, from the collection devices that are deployed worldwide uh, to our facilities in West Virginia that process and deliver our commanders uh, information uh, based on those, that biometric uh, uh, intelligence. Uh, most uh, uh, relevant to this discussion in, in cyberspace uh, for multi-domain, uh, uh, we also deliver the electronic warfare capability for the Army. Uh, we are also the center of excellence for offensive cyber. And critically, and not of, often talked about, is uh, we are the Army's linkage to the intelligence community for material uh, through our Tactical Exploitation and National Capabilities Office. Uh, so we, we uh, uh, provide that linkage to the IC, uh, specifically in this uh, uh, concept of SEMA and other areas where they've uh, invested heavily. Uh, we try to deliver those capabilities to the Army and work very closely to do that. Uh, I'd like to start my talk with something I heard at AUSA from the Chief of Staff of the Army last year. Uh, he talked about significant change is here now and forever. And, and, and that may seem obvious, right? Um, but for me, you know, I grew up as an EW. Uh, I, I built jammers when I first got into uh, civilian service. And to have the Chief of Staff of the Army talking about non-kinetic effects uh, through this concept of SEMA through electronic warfare is something the Army hasn't done for, for quite a long time. Uh, and it, was real, it is really exciting, but it is also uh, very challenging, right? Uh, uh, this concept of SEMA uh, is at the intersection of uh, not just the functional elements in a talk, but the functional elements of us as an acquisition community. Uh, here in this panel, uh, all of our PEOs touch everything that has to do with are all of the aspects that have to do to deliver the effects that the commander's gonna need to have this cyberspace freedom of maneuver. Uh, that's really complicated. That's not something that uh, one solution is gonna deliver. That's not something that, that uh, any capability is, is, is going to, some silver bullet that's gonna be delivered by any of the PEOs here. It requires a concerted, integrated effort uh, across all of our products in order to deliver that. So it was really exciting to have the Chief of Staff talk about it to really have the Army invest in this rapid capability office to get after these near-term threats. But that's not what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, what I talk about is, is the future, the programs of record, the capabilities that we have to build for our Army that are gonna be around for 30 or 40 years that we're gonna ask General Taylor and his team to deliver and support for the long term of the Army. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about three things in that area. Uh, first is something that I'm obviously very passionate about and that's electronic warfare and electronic attack. Uh, the second is uh, this sensor proliferation, this demand for sensors. And third, and at the risk of being redundant to Mr. Martin, is this sensor complex, this complexity of our architectures that we're delivering. Uh, whether that's intelligence or communications, there's, there's clearly a, a common theme there. Uh, so firstly, I, I wanna talk about the, uh, the Army needs an electronic warfare capability. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't around when the Tilki and Turkeys and, and, and these other capabilities were here, but, but we've lost some of the institutional 
uh, our capabilities when it comes to delivering electronic attack. Uh, we have a very robust, and, and, and our PEO owns the defensive electronic capability, uh, defensive electronic attack capabilities uh, that are leveraged today. Um, Mr. Wiltsey and, and our PEO are investing in the near-term threats to get after electronic warfare, uh, but the focus for the long term is getting after threat agility, right? We all read the news, we all understand that the threats today are near, to, not only near peer, but all of the threats today are using electronic warfare, they're using spectrum-based effects to impact how we're gonna operate. That's a fact. And the environment that we're gonna go in, whether that's communications, whether that's jamming, is getting, getting, is, is going to be more complex over the next 10 or 15 years as well. Today's threat will not be tomorrow's threat, and tomorrow's threat will not be, and so on and so forth. So building solutions that are multifunctional electronic warfare is not just a, a program, it's not just a concept, it's something that we need to go after so that we don't have to go to Mr. Wiltsey every time a new threat comes up to get a rapid solution, that we have a solution that can adapt as the threat adapts. Now, it won't be perfect. We won't get after every threat. Uh, we won't meet every requirement that's in the requirement document but incrementally building a solution that, that adapts with the threat is critical to our portfolio and General Volmec's priority. Uh, secondly is this uh, 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 concept, th 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 this demand for sensors. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know how else to put it in that over time, regardless of what's happening uh, uh, in CENTCOM or in AFRICOM or in UCOM, uh, the, the demand for the, the aerial sensors has always increased. Um, and our footprint forward has decreased significantly. And so the intelligence community has put a lot of investment, a lot of time, a lot of capability in putting sensors forward and having soldiers in, here in CONUS processing those sensors. Now, all of that is great. It sounds, you know, it, it is. It's an awesome capability here at Fort Gordon with the 116th. However, it provides a real significant burden on our networks. And so as we look forward over the next five to 10 years, and, and we increase the number of boxes and sensors that we place on, in place, that burden to the network will, will continue. And so the challenge that, 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 that our PEO is laying to industry, our PEO is laying to the science technology community is how do we get more information? How do we still deliver that accurate and timely information, whether that's intelligence, whether that's uh, video for integrated base defense, uh, whether that's situational awareness that on our survivability platforms that are threats there. How do we get all that capability, enhanced capability that we need uh, without burdening the network anymore? Uh, don't assume that that network's gonna be uh, thicker and broader and there for us. So how do we build more smart sensors uh, that build pre-tracks that, that uh, 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 still can uh, leverage the swap that they have uh, and get after sort of technologies that are more uh, easily uh, discernible in terms of the, the intelligence they provide. Not just providing data, but providing that intelligence earlier in the sensor. And the last thing I'll talk about, and I'm gonna be very brief, because Mr. Martin made all the points that I was gonna make, and he made them more eloquently than I could, uh, which is, uh, uh, as we build these sensors, as we build these more uh, capabilities, uh, the complexity increases. Uh, the burden, the cognitive burden on our soldiers is very real. It's very hard to deal with because if the environment is very complex, you typically need complex to solutions to solve that complexity. And, and there is no easy way to say it, right? If you're building complex systems, they're complicated for the soldier to use. And not only just for the soldier, they're complicated for the sustainers and maintainers because we build systems in the Army that are here for 20 and 30 years, not for two or three. So, uh, 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 how we build those sensors and systems, understanding that they need to reduce that cognitive burden, to reduce that burden on the sustainers and maintainers long term, is another focus of the PEO in enabling this, this concept of SEMA. So uh, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I apologize for being quite brief and quite quick, but uh, we're, we're excited to get to your questions. Sir. Thank you, Mark. Uh, your comments triggered a memory here. I failed to mention that the SEMA conference for this year will be at Every Improving Ground. Yes, October sir. 16th through 19, all right, 16th through 19, October APG, uh, in, in cooperation with the Association of Old, Old Crows, who co-sponsor that. So you'll see General Nakasone there, me, Sarbacom Commander, many others. Most of the discussions will be classified. We take one of our large theater-style uh, theater auditoriums there and 
turn into a secure facility for the conference. So if you can join us, and then again on the 20th will be our <coughs> Centennial Ball. All right, so we've got a lot of questions stacking up over here. So why don't you go ahead with the first one, please. Good morning, sir. My name is John. I'll be asking the questions that are coming in over the, uh, the Gmail link that, that's on the bottom of the screen. The first question is about battle labs. How do the PEOs work with the battle labs or leverage the result of their tests? Great. So we've got a couple, three PEOs represented here. Gary, you want to start with that? Yeah, a more recent example would be uh, our development of the common operating environment, particularly for the command post computing environment. So we've been working with the Battle Labs at Leavenworth in order to, and the uh, Mission Command Center of Excellence, to actually take emerging versions of the uh, product in development down to Leavenworth and get active user feedback on the development. So when we talk about simplifying the user interface, making it more intuitive, uh, getting to the target audience, which is not often the case. Often we build a product and when we get to testing, operational testing, we start integrating with soldiers. And so getting them into the process uh, early on is a significant part. And the other example would be much of the experimentation testing we do today requires access to infrastructure and on the backside, soldier operators. So we have a regional hub node for our WinT system that is at Fort Gordon, operated by the Battle Lab. And so whenever we do experimentation and, and network uh, testing, uh, they provide the capability to operate the backside of the uh, regional hub node capability. So they're an active participant uh, in all of our experimentation. In addition to Battle Labs, another great R&D capability we have is uh, under RDECOM, the Army's Research Development and Engineering Command, there is CERDEC, the Communication Electronics Research Development and Engineering Command. That's OPCON to CECOM, and so they work very closely with the PEOs on Anything R&D regarding C4ESR? Uh, Mark, did you have anything else on that regarding uh, Battle Lab? Sure. Yes, sir. So uh, we work very closely with the Battle Lab to do um, early assessments of commercial and non-commercial uh, technologies. Uh, but in the end, a lot of the assessments from the Battle Labs come down to contract language. Uh, how do we, uh, uh, in the end, evaluate proposals uh, based upon direct feedback from soldiers? Uh, that, that becomes very critical for us in ensuring that we get after what the soldiers are prioritizing when they evaluate a product uh, so that when we do the award, when we do a best value trade off, that we're trading off the direct feedback from those soldiers in the battle labs. Uh, so primarily that's where uh, the, that feedback ends up with us. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah, most I was, was going to say that in uh, the defense of cyber operations uh, piece there, working with our cyber and others, this piece about this year is all about looking at the requirements and uh, our strategy going into 18, 19, and 20. So that piece of it has, you know, helping shape what I was talking about earlier, that community, and what do we really need and what does industry or even the labs have that can help shape the outcomes of those programs. So yeah, we're tied in pretty tight this, uh, this year on, that, on the, uh, that area of defensive cyber. Yeah, good. Yeah, Mark, you mentioned contracting. Uh, yeah. Most of the contracting for POEIS and C3T is done with ACCAPG, Army Contracting Command yeah. element uh, at APG, which is also OPCON to CECOM. And just the proximity of IEWNS, C3T, CERDEC, CECOM, and ACCAPG, all co-located at APG, really helps bring together teams C4ISR. John, next question. Yes, sir. With the fast pace of innovation in the IT area, what is the plan to sustain hardware, equipment, and software after programs transition to sustainment in order to maintain capability, relevancy, interoperability, and operational value? Okay, awesome question. I did not write that, but I'll take that. Uh, I, I tell you, the key to getting, uh, to improving our sustainment, especially given the reality that we stain, sustain systems, equipment, much longer than we anticipate, right? That's just a, kind of a fact of life these days, is understanding the challenges as best we can up front. When we, when we develop the acquisition strategy, this is huge. And our, our life cycle sustainment plans, uh, we have to factor in from the start the anticipated cost of sustainment to include things like, you know, license upgrades and uh, renewals and Obsolescence, our biggest challenge in supply availability is parts obsolescence. It's huge, it's, it's really killing us. Uh, and we are incentivizing some incredibly bad behavior. 
on the part of industry. I can talk at length on that. But factoring the cost of things like that at the start, building that into the acquisition uh, life cycle, and programming for it, understanding the, the, the cost and programming that in early on and making those hard decisions at the beginning, at the outset, is uh, what we need to do better to really move uh, sustainment uh, forward in the Army. Anything else in sustainment from the yeah, I absolutely agree with the upfront doing that piece. In fact, we, we recently had our home on home mm -hmm. with, with CECOM and coming out of that task there, what we realized in EIS, even with our ERP systems, for example, is that there, there may be opportunities to transition those programs in part uh, to CECOM. So uh, our folks already, and I mentioned uh, Colonel Sloan, Mike Sloan, who is the APEO uh, for that ERP. That's one of the things he's working on is what is that plan for sustainment of it? Because that, that's an area that we've lacked in, yeah. um, that we are now having a transition uh, strategy that's being, uh, being developed for that. Good, thanks. Next question, John. Yes, sir. The Army has convened several high-level reviews with industry to review Army networks and determine what can be done to improve the network. I would like to get the panel's thought on what is being done to meet the requirements of current and near future Army networks. What is being done to ensure WinT can provide support in modern land warfare? Gary, that one has your name all over it. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the ongoing studies that certainly have been in the media are continuing and the final decisions of where the uh, chief will want to take our investment strategy is, is yet to have been done. But I would tell you that a lot of what we're doing uh, is, and it's part of the conversation that we're having, is a significant part of the issues that we've been concerned about. Signal modernization, for example, uh, is a program that has been funded for a number of years, uh, and it's specifically targeted years ago. Uh, investments in things that we knew we had to do because we had to enhance our ability to communicate beyond line of sight without reliance on SATCOM. We had to look at reducing the footprint of our communications infrastructure, looking at multi uh, diverse, uh, di diverse path to operate in a contested environment. So things like next generation Tropo, the Trilos radio, the McNay, all of these things, uh, CP uh, Wi-Fi, the ability to remove a significant burden of laying wires and so forth in command post to make them more agile. These things uh, started years ago and are covered under a set of requirements that Fort Gordon uh, has put in place. And all of those are all commercial products. None of them are developmental programs. Uh, we're releasing an RFP, getting the best industry has, and buying the products that industry has available to us. So they're very much non-developmental idle program. Where we're starting to realize the, uh, the things that need to be reconsidered is where do we put them? All of those products I'm talking about were intended to go to expeditionary signal battalions. The question now is, do they go into the brigades organically as capability? And, and that's a conversation that's underway now. It's not really a technology one, it's where do you put the capability? And of course, there'll be implications of how much equipment can you give to a BCT and, and do they have the manpower and a variety of other things. But uh, I think the technology uh, to do much of what we want to do is available. The question is, uh, how fast can we procure it? Where do you put it and how do you manage it? Doug, you have a departmental view. Anything to add to that? Well, so the, the chief's doing a review. Everybody knows that. Um, and, and it is uh, in, in part based on uh, the capabilities that he that we have, the capabilities he believes we have, and remember that the that the threat gets a vote. And so, as we move out of one type of conflict into what we believe are one or two different, very different types of conflict, we're making adjustments to that. Um, let this thing play. It, it it has got a long way to go, and and so. There's a lot of people jumping to conclusions. At the, at, at the end of this, as you take into account where we think technology is, as we take into account uh, where the threats are driving us, if you take into account the types of geography that we believe we're going to be, con we'd be fighting in, um, the review needs to be done, and, and we'll allow it to just as, as they see fit. Good. Thank you. All right, back uh, to you, I would add yeah, just one more ahead, thing. Gary. I think one of the things the Army is going to have to wrap its head around is, does everybody need the same capability? 
I mean, most of our programs today are structured to buy a capability and get it to the entire Army. And so if you take a, a WinT increment one, it's our, our, our network uh, that is distributed across the entire force. Uh, we have a very good construct within that program where we do tech refresh of the technology every couple of years. Uh, so the WinT increment one that we are completing fielding now is increment 1B. We have completely tech refreshed the entire Army. Next year, we start the next cycle. The Army is huge. And so to give a new capability to the entire Army takes a long time, whether it's mission command applications or network technology. The real question we're going to have to deal with is, does everyone have to be equipped the same? Because what we're going to have to balance is, uh, how long does it take to get a, the next capability to the entire Army versus if you try to spin out uh, more quickly and get portions of the Army, uh, you start getting to variations of capability. And then you get back into training and, and, and those kinds of, or perhaps even compatibility issues. So we've got some real challenge that we've, we've got to deal with, and, and we try to deal with them uh, in a sustainment side. Fortunately, on, on the uh, wind increment one, the tech refresh, the EE peg is, is paying for it. So we're not passing a bill to the sustainment peg, but what we are doing is, is uh, trying to get the latest technology into the force. But the <coughs> Army is huge, and, and we're going to have to figure out do you get certain capabilities to certain formations and spit them at different rates. And, and that's, that's a tough, complicated problem. Good. Thanks again, Gary. All right, John. OK, sir, the next question is for uh, Mark Kitts. Does PEO IEWS see COTS over NDI? Mm. So I, I think. Um, yeah, interesting question. So uh, the, the, each program has their own unique acquisition strategy, and whether that's uh, commercial, non-developmental, uh, that in concert with Army Contracting Command, that decision is made uh, for each unique program. Uh, I'd say in our portfolio, um, in our developmental activities, uh, we have uh, commercial buys and non-developmental buys uh, in terms of software, in terms of hardware. Um, I think. What, what we'd like to get to and what we've been working very closely with CERDEC on is sort of these frameworks uh, where we can buy commercial and non-developmental uh, activities or, or solutions uh, that get integrated into a solution to get after this threat agility that I talked about. So that we're buying from one company a, a, a framework, a platform, uh, and then we're buying an algorithm or another solution from their competitor to integrate. Uh, that's where we want to get to, to ensure that we get uh, uh, aligned or in front of the threat in an open and adaptable way uh, without being parochial about openness, ensuring that we can integrate across uh, these commercial and non-developmental activities. So I hopefully want, I answered the question. And I want to ask you a follow-up on that, Mark. So uh, you work a lot with the other services and three-letter agencies. What's PO IEWS doing to ensure compatibility of systems? being developed right now? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So uh, we have multiple program offices that deal directly with the intelligence community. Um, uh, at the foremost of that is our tactical exploitation and national capabilities office. Um, and so we actually, uh, in multiple of our programs, directly take solutions from the intelligence community and field them to soldiers. And uh, so th that's a win-win for the taxpayer and that's a win-win for our soldiers because our soldiers are getting trained and going into rotations at the NGA, at NSA, at the intelligence community, uh, where they're learning tradecraft and then using that tradecraft directly with solutions that we take. Uh, that doesn't always work, right? A lot of the intelligence community tends to be uh, uh, a very uh, uh, tends to be very focused in areas, whereas our soldiers and our community is much broader. Uh, so we have to balance this uh, uh, ability to, to 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 maintain our our tradecraft and our professionalism in a way that makes sense uh, partnered with the intelligence community. Good. Hopefully Thanks. I answered that. Yeah, good, it, it did. John, over to you. If you okay, don't have sir. one, I've got one uh, oh. teed up for Doug Wiltsy uh, <laughs> to follow up on a comment he made about NIE 17-2, but what do you have, John? Save Roger, me, sir. John. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll save time for that one. Um, th this is for Mr. Wiltsy and Mr. Martin. C could you discuss the apparent tension between disparate solutions and the intent to simplify and standardize Army C3I solutions. My what? question was easier. 
<laughs> yeah. Is, is there an issue? And I'll tell you where one of our challenges is. Uh, for almost any technology that we would bring into the network, there are n different solution vendors, right? In, in, the, in the world of IT, there's not one. There are many. And so one of the challenges we have is, so how do you take advantage of what technology, uh, the vendor community can do and, and do it at a pace that allows you to bring the right capability? Uh, take our world and Mark's is a good example. Uh, the world of software-defined radios, which is at the heart of everything we're doing today, and the electronic warfare solutions, if you pull the cover off that box, you can't tell if it's a radio or EW device. It's the same stuff. So when do these worlds converge? When do we buy a common set of solutions that might be able to be far more agile? Now, there's work that's been done by CERDIC and a variety of other folks and folks in the, in the audience here. I would tell you that technology is not the problem, it's the, why, the way we're structured. His funding comes out of a different peg than mine. His requirements come out of a different community, in, in some cases, than mine. Uh, the user community is different. And so we, we're not structured to buy things in a way that allows us to get after multiple problems at the same time. Now, if you do that, by the way, it's probably not NDI and it's probably not COTS. We get back into the world of some moderate amount of development to at least put a framework and an environment in place that you, you can then leverage quick turns on, on components. But we're not at a place right now where we can adapt that way in worlds that are converging, particularly in the SEMA environment. So not understanding the details of the question or the context of the question, what I would tell you is that um, the way the Army's moving forward is with this thing called the Common Operating Environment, which allows us to bin things that have their set of standards. So Gary's running the, compute, the, the command post computing environment, which he's collapsing the, the, the hardware down to a single set of servers that will allow all of Mission Command to ride on it, regardless of whether it's under his portfolio or someone else's. And there's a plan to migrate those apps over so they use common, common hardware, We'll put all the operating environments in the service layer and, and then the apps with an SDK and that'll transition. That gets to the heart of if there was a disparate problem in, in, in Mission Command. Uh, Mark Kitz's guys are working the sensor side of this. So what's the standards for any sensor to communicate back to, uh, to either a ground station or to uh, Mission Command to be able to interact, pass information, allow leaders the information they need to make decisions. You got the same thing with mounted. Gary's running the mounted and they've consolidated that that piece real time safety critical is being done out of uh, uh, yeah, out of aviation and, and uh, well out of Huntsville uh, for missiles in space and aviation. And, and and so the common operating environment will drive you to those set of standards that allow that fixes those interfaces. Um, I, I hope that answers the question. Good. Thank you. John? If I could just tag on to that real yeah, quick, too. Um, if you look at our programs, um, we have the, um, the logistics programs, the human capital programs, the financial programs. We also have a secure side of each of those programs that use the same applications and common hardware and those type of things. But the requirements come from the, the more sensitive side of it. So it's again, it's about structuring and trying to use programs that are, are common for, for the obvious reasons. Good. Thank you, Kevin. All right, John, what do you have? All right, so we just got a few minutes left, so if you wanted to ask your question. and Yeah, sure. So, Doug, up. you mentioned uh, NIE 17-2. I'm curious <laughs> about some of the key outcomes. Um, so 72 just, just ended uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, as I said, probably the biggest thing was the ability for us um, within the Army to take a different unit than, than the 2nd Brigade of the 1st Armored Division and actually exercise it. The, 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 the feedback from, from the unit is very, very positive. Uh, one that uh, as part of the exercise, they were actually able to deploy and then pull all the IRSOI and, and then and redeploy. And, and that's something that, that you don't get if you're stationed at Fort Bliss. Um, the capability for them to uh, drop into an exercise that um, if you will, is not really being graded from a, from, a, from a mission rehearsal exercise standpoint or certification standpoint, allows them to, 
to, to work um, other pieces. They were running a test, um, very favorable results of, of uh, the two test systems that were under test, which, Mar uh, which Gary had talked about, where they had put them on Humvees. They were actually able to sling load them. Uh, the brigade was able to jump their talk in a few hours, uh, where they were down and then back up. The, the battalion tack jumped. Uh, and they were back up and I think it was 90 minutes. So we're making significant progress in the way we're able to be more expeditionary. Uh, with regard to electronic warfare, we're learning a whole lot. Um, yeah, we're learning a whole lot. Um, got grades on material solutions, got grades on how it was employed. I think they learned some things about how maybe they should have employed. The bigger thing was how the OP4 employed it. Uh, so it was a different battalion commander uh, within the 2101, and he just had a ball. He just went nuts. Gave him a whole lot of kit, and he just did a lot of good things. That goes back into the unit, though, and they start to work. How would you, how would you change? What would you do differently? And so uh, being able to, in 17, to be able to create a degraded environment, a contested environment, um, they're learning a lot of things. They're paying a lot of attention now to their sign to what their to what their signature looks like. What does a brigade in the electromagnetic spectrum look like? How far away can I be detected? Um, and, and and all that's going to be just absolutely invaluable to them as they go forward. So I, we're we're starting to get at this was a this was a near peer fight, um, and so they were able to. Uh, to engage in that, which they hadn't. They had just come back out of Afghanistan um, six, nine months before, uh, so they were really focused on that fight. Now we put them in a different fight. They were able to adjust. So it, I think overall it was a great success, allowed us to bring some kid in that uh, uh, we, they'd not seen before, employ it. We learned a lot. What you'll find is that if you get bad comments out of this, that's not failure because you're learning something. And then you can do it again and again and again, and we can get better and better and better. So I think overall, it was a great exercise. Thank you, Doug. That's the end of our time. Thank you, John and Paul and the team back there. If you would, ladies and gentlemen, help me thank our panelists. Thank you, sir. Please welcome back Mike Warlick back to the stage to thank the panel on behalf of AFCIA and our audience. Uh, General Taylor, thank you very much for that, uh, that panel. You know, the thing that stuck out to me the most was the compassion of each one of these panel members this morning. Uh, they, they are focused in developing the right solution at the right time for the right soldier. Uh, just a couple thoughts. Uh, Gary, Gary Martin, Tactical Radios, Challenges of Win-T, the Common Operational Environment. You hear it every day and sometimes on the news. Uh, Doug Wiltsey, uh, Solutions for Strategic Gaps, especially in a contested environment. We heard about that yesterday, and we're going to hear a lot more of that go as we go into the future. Uh, Colonel Stoddard, uh, he discovered, he discussed the, uh, the, uh, the enterprise and how the enterprise uh, works from the tactical edge to the strategic uh, environment and the focus on, uh, always on the enterprise to make sure we can uh, communicate up and down. Mark Kitts, the tactical precision that the, uh, the delivery of the tactical sensors to the Army. I think that's the, the one thing that stuck out to me uh, the most. And also the, uh, the challenges and the agility that uh, is needed to, be, to keep up with the, the requirements that are out there. It, that's, a broad, that's a broad area. These panel members really did not connect uh, uh, and, and personally, like you heard them this morning, this was a well-oiled machine that talked to you today. And I hope you take the opportunity to spend a few minutes uh, with them uh, at the conclusion of this uh, session. So uh, in summary, uh, General Taylor, uh, thank you very much uh, for you and your panel being here this morning. Uh, in lieu of a, a gift, we'll make a donation to the Fisher House on behalf of the entire panel. And we thank you very much for being here today. We got a couple things coming up. Uh, first of all, we have a break uh, that's going to provide you an opportunity to get out there and uh, visit the exhibits and attend uh, a number of uh, sessions that you see on the uh, the wing boards right now. Uh, starting at 12, we'll be showing a live video feed potentially, potentially a JCSC. The weather is a, a factor, and I did not get the final outcome for that. But if the JCSC. Uh, uh, booth downstairs, that'll be, uh, uh, that'll be a live feed when that happens. 
As a reminder, uh, today's lunch, and again, is uh, down, uh, down on the back of the, uh, 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 the facility here. Uh, Cisco is the sponsor today. We want to thank Cisco for that. If the meal is good as yesterday, we're going to continue this track. Uh, it's a barbecue, uh, a barbecue lunch today. We want you to enjoy the networking break, and we want you to experience all that you can today and build on, on to tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you again this afternoon. Thank you very much.